Pleased to say that my new book is coming out any day now. Um, this book is part of the prestigious series um, of the British Film Institute, the BFI Classic Series, published by Bloomsbury. The BFI Classic Series, series of books, each of which is devoted to one film, a film that is an obvious Hollywood classic, or not necessarily Hollywood classic, just, just an obvious classic in the history of cinema, like, say, The Wizard of Oz, um, or films that may have been overlooked a little bit during their time and are true classics but need to be brought to the forefront of cultural consciousness um, and hopefully open people up to films that they've not seen before and allow them to experience these films as classics. Well, I think my book in the BFI Classic series falls into the latter category. My, my, my book is on John Borman's 1967 film, Point Blank. I'm starring Lee Marvin and Angie Dickinson. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to give a series of talks uh, which highlight what I think is most interesting about the film. And in doing so, in addition, highlighting parts of the film that I think you yourself will enjoy. My hope is that after you hear these talks, you will check the film out and after that, buy my book. And hopefully that book will deepen your understanding, enhance your appreciation of the film. So in this talk, I want to talk about how John Borman's 1967 film, Point Blank, plays with genre plays with traditional Hollywood genres. What Borman does is he brings together more than one genre, at least three genres, that are fairly recognizable, but he mashes them up in such a way that he creates really an unprecedented kind of film for the most part. Um, a film that feels strange because it can't quite be categorized. Is it a revenge film? Um, is it... A dreamy film? A, a trippy film? <laughs> a hallucinatory film? Yeah, is it a new wave film? Experimental European film? Um, is it a Western in its own way? Yeah. Um, is it a, a, a psychological film that explores trauma? Yeah, it's all these things. Is, is, it, is it all serious? Is it somewhat comic? It's both. So I think part of what make the film, makes the film so interesting is how it does blend genres. In doing so, the film has influenced some of the most important filmmakers and films of the past 20 years or so. So I want to work back to the genre blurring in Point Blank by talking about some more recent films that it has influenced. The contemporary director most influenced by Point Blank would be Steven Soderbergh. Um, Steven Soderbergh, um, most famous for, well, maybe not most famous, but very famous for his breakout film, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, which really inaugurated, along with Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing and Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, the whole indie film movement of the 1990s. But Soderbergh's range is vast. He's also done the, um, the great Oceans films as well as some important action films. But one of the Soderbergh films that I most like is The Limey, starring Terrence Stamp. And this film is essentially a remake of Point Blank. It's about a man who is coming from England to investigate the death of his daughter um, in Los Angeles. She died under mysterious circumstances. The, the father wants to understand, father played by Terrence Stamp, wants to understand and seek revenge. He wants to avenge his daughter's death. So on the, on the surface, The Limey is a revenge film. But it's not only that. Um, it's also a film about grief, mourning, nostalgia, um, psychologically explores these conditions. The main character, Terrence Stamp's character, he neglected his daughter when she was young. Um, he was involved in crime. He was away from home a lot, spent time in prison. And so he feels tremendous guilt over abandoning her and feels that if he had been closer to her, maybe this would not have happened. So it's, it's a film about a man working through guilt. 
It's also a film that explores the relationship between dream and reality. Uh, the way the film plays with time, the way the film blurs the line between what's actually happening in the plot and what Stamp's character is thinking about um, is, is a way of exploring how trauma often works. It, it, it often keeps the sufferer from moving forward into the present. The, 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 the person traumatized tends to sort of replay the trauma over and over again and therefore can't move forward in a healthy way. So Soderbergh emphasizes that by filming the story in such a way as you often can't tell what's happening in the present and what's happening in the past, what's happening actually in the plot, and what's happening inside of the head of Terrence Stamp. Also, the film is funny. It's extremely funny. Uh, the way Terrence Stamp speaks is so strange to the Americans. Uh, there, there's an array of, of colorful characters. So the film's a comedy. Yes. The film's a revenge film, crime film, thriller. Yes. The film's a kind of hypnotic meditation on memory and grief. Yes. This comes straight out of Point Blank. Um, Soderbergh provides commentary on the most recent DVD release of Point Blank along, along with Borman. Very much worth listening to to learn about the film Point Blank, but also to learn about Soderbergh's love of the film. Another film that is highly indebted to Point Blank is Christopher Nolan's Memento, uh, which is about another man who has suffered a terrible loss and is trying to understand this loss. The problem is he has no memory. Uh, he takes, Guy Pierce plays the protagonist, he takes photographs of uh, things that happen, Polaroids, uh, to help him remember what actually happened and what didn't. He tattoos information on his body to help him remember information he thinks he needs, all in service of this quest um, to find out how, how his wife died and what, what can he do about it. Very much like Lee Marvin's character, Walker, in Point Blank, a, a man who has suffered great betrayal and is really trying to figure out a way to work through that betrayal. Another film that owes a lot to Point Blank would be Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. Not so much for the theme, um, working through trauma of some kind, but for this blurring, again, of, of, of genre. And, and again, the, the memento, I didn't really say this, um, it obviously blurs genre in the same way that the Limey does. It's a revenge film, but also it's a film about memory and psychology um, and about time. It's kind of a philosophical film. Well, Tarantino's films are notorious for taking the straight up crime genre and turning that into comedy. Um, for instance, like we see in Reservoir Dogs, these are, these are hard boiled killers. Um, out to steal diamonds, but yet the, the way they talk to each other is so compelling, so engaging, so witty, so funny, so smart. So it's a crime film, but also it's kind of like a comedy of manners where it's a bunch of dudes sitting around talking all the time, like a chamber drama. And Tarantino in his later films is constantly playing around with, with different kinds of genres. I mean, most prominently in a film like Kill Bill, where you have kung fu films and, and westerns and women and the women's films, so on and so forth. I mean, Tarantino is really the master of um, blurring genres. So these are just three filmmakers, three films that owe um, a lot of their DNA to John Borman's Point Blank. Um, I, I could mention um, other films. Um, Baby Driver has a very um, point blank kind of vibe to it. I think Ryan Gosling's Drive as well. In any case, point blank. How is it playing around the genre? Well, first and foremost, it is a film that qualifies as neo-noir. Uh, you probably know in, in, the, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, uh, a, a lot of Hollywood crime films that were moody and brooding and morally ambiguous. 
uh, were called film noir um, by some of the French critics. Um, and this, a lot of these noirish conventions were uh, revived in the 60s and the 70s. Think of Chinatown, it's probably the most, prom the most prominent neo-noir, where it's actually set during the time almost when these noirs, traditional noirs took place. Um, but there are, there are other neo-noirs um, of the 60s and 70s we might think of. Um, Night Moves, starring Gene Hackman. Uh, he's a private investigator, like, like, a, like a Bogart in Big Sleep or, or a Bogart in Maltese Falcon. And he's thrown to this morally ambiguous world. Um, it's hard to tell what's what. Um, but ultimately, he lacks the kind of heroism and acumen of someone like um, Bogart. So neo-noir kind of takes the conventions of noir and ironizes them. Um, basically saying in the 60s and the 70s, the world is even more ambiguous than it was <laughs> in the 40s and 50s. And the, the main character of the, of the noir lacks the mastery of, of, of the characters like Bogart plays. So, so we see um, Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye, where Elliot Gould plays the private investigator. But he's kind of a loopy wacko. <laughs> he's always talking to himself. Uh, he doesn't seem to know what's going on. He's slovenly. So that's, that's, that's another example of the neo-noir. Well, Point Blank has a neo-noir feel because it does have a tradition. It's a lot of the convention of the traditional crime film, but it's morally ambiguous. And, and the main character, Lee Marvin, has a hard time getting mastery of his environment like someone like Bogart. There's a so-called femme fatale in the film. It could go on. So you have the neo-noir. Um, it's also the revenge film. Uh, think, think of revenge films. Um, Clint Eastwood is famous for the revenge film, um, in particular Outlaw Josie Wales, which comes later, of course. But this is very much a film, point blank, about a man who has been wrong and wants to right that wrong. Speaking of Clint Eastwood, the film has a lot of qualities of the kinds of westerns that Clint Eastwood was making in the 60s in Italy, the so-called spaghetti westerns, um, directed by Sergio Leone, um, A Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More, and The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, um, the trilogy about the man with no name. Um, these films are short on speech, large on gesture, uh, lots of huge vistas of dry, arid landscape with single men, gunfighters standing there. We see this play out in Point Blank. Um, Marvin's character says very little throughout the film, very stoic. Um, also, it, it, is, it is L.A. with the way that Borman renders it, all its aridity, um, all the pavement, all the huge spaces dwarfing these men, it feels a lot like a Western, um, a man in a Western seeking revenge. But also the film shares a lot with the French New Wave. If you watch Alan René's um, Hiroshima Mon Amour, for instance, the way it plays with time um, to try to explore trauma, um, Borman draws on that. There, you see a lot of Alain René in... Point Blank. Uh, you see a lot of Jean-Luc Godard in Point Blank. The way the film um, is not continuous, the way it is fragmented, um, the, the way that it is making time subjective. And when we experience time subjectively, we rarely experience it in a linear kind of way. So the minimalism of the spaghetti western the violence of the revenge film, um, the conventions of the noir, um, some of the techniques of the European New Wave. These are all in play in this film. And on the surface, the film seems very serious, but it's also comical as well. There are a lot of moments of dark comedy in the film. Um, so when you do see the film, you'll, you'll think, gosh, was this film influenced by Tarantino or um, Soderbergh or no one? <laughs> well, it's the opposite. So I think that's one reason to check the film out. J just on a formal level, it's extremely interesting. And not only that, you can see where a lot of the, the great moments of more contemporary cinema came from. <laughs>